All right, this is interesting. Again, I haven't read any of these yet. Uh, Bill, if you personally, this is not a general question about talent or virtue, could pass along your greatest virtue, talent, or attribute to a son or daughter who would be changed with carrying on your legacy, what would that talent, virtue, or attribute be? Wow. Synthesis, I think. I think that's what I do. I think that's that's the only thing I'm probably good at. Um, I'm, I'm just barely smart enough to understand some of the things that are very complex that people who are much smarter than me deal with every day. Just barely smart enough to get my hands around that. And because I am a, a good storyteller, and I've been a storyteller since I remember publishing an article in the school newspaper when I was five or something, that was a damn good story too. Um, because I can tell a story, I've got just enough intelligence to find um, the, the, the complexities of something very complex and difficult, and I can reduce it to something that is understandable by most people, by just about everybody, because that's how I have to understand it. Um, I don't come up with a, a lot of new ideas. In fact, I don't come up with any new ideas. I have occasionally some turns of language that I'm rather happy with, but I don't come up with anything new. It's not like there's such a thing as Bill Whittleism, which is a new way of looking at the world. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not a painter. I don't create things. I'm like, I'm like my fiance. I'm a photographer. I record things that are going on out there and, and present them. Um, now, I'm not trying to sell myself short. The ability to make something simple is a very high level of mastery. Um, anybody can make things complicated. It's easy to make things more complicated. Just shovel more stuff in there. It's shoveling the stuff out of there that's the hard part. Um, you know, we talk about writing a screenplay, a movie screenplay. People think the movie screenplay is finished when you've taken out all the bad stuff. Now, that's the easy part. Anybody, any idiot with a gram of talent can, um, can take out the bad stuff. A really great writer knows which wonderful stuff to throw away, which absolutely tremendous, unbelievably great stuff are you going to chuck away because it's not helping. That's hard. That's actually really quite hard to, to, to throw away the great stuff. So I would say, um, yeah, synthesis and observation. I've spent a lot of time watching and listening to things. My beautiful fiance reminds me constantly when I think about, you know, I'm pushing 60 years old and, you know, I spent the first half of my life, or certainly the middle half of my life uh, so far, just doing nothing. I mean, just got nothing done. I didn't accomplish anything. I was just wasted. And she constantly reminds me, she said, you were doing something. You were, you were doing something. You were listening to something. You were learning something. Because you get up on stage and you need something, and there it is, pal. So, yeah, I guess it's true. Um, you get... Uh, The one, one of the things that, uh, since you asked, one of the things that I think is unique about me, relatively unique about me, is, um, is the fact that I live in both of these worlds. That's, that's somewhat unusual, I would say. I um, wanted to be a pilot, wanted to be a fighter pilot. I understand fighter pilots. I understand airplanes. I'd make an excellent fighter pilot. I'm not sure I'd make an excellent military person, but I would make an excellent fighter pilot. Aggressive, and I'm smart, and... Uh, and I'm aggressive, and I know how the planes work. And not only do I know how they work, I feel them. I feel how they work. When I was taking flying lessons, I remember my instructor saying, <clears throat> you're going to be fine, and you're never going to get in trouble up here. And I said, well, why is that? He said, because you feel it. You don't have to be told that the plane is getting slower. You know it. You can feel it. You can feel the, the, feel the controls. You can hear it. So, um, so all of that kind of mechanical astronomy, science, um, you know, instrument rating frequencies, all of this hard kind of science and, um, and technology I'm very familiar with. I'm not familiar with it enough to make a living in any one part of it, but that's okay. I can tell you the difference between an uh, AIM-9 or X uh, missile and an, and, an, you know, and an earlier model of the Sidewinder missile. I know all this stuff. and it just I know it because I'm interested in it. I just do it for fun. I thought it was cool. And so there's all of that. And at the same time, somehow... I fell into the theater department, and that aspect of entertainment was something I was ex equally at home with and equally interested in. And I was just, I just loved it. And so it's it's unusual to find somebody who, um, somebody who could basically describe to you in some fair detail how a jet engine works, and at the same time, somebody who knows a good font and color combination. That's a little unusual. So, uh... 
that gives me some perspective on things. And frankly, I think what I probably do is I take, you know, my ability to deal with these hard things and my ability to deal with these soft things and put them together in such an order that it tells a little bit of a story that somebody can connect to. It's something simply similar to something that happened to me. And um, so that's uh, that's what I would say it is. So it's observation and synergy, and and not to again since you asked uh, Cameron, you gotta you gotta chuck a fair amount of courage in there. You mentioned virtues, and and uh, synthesis and observation are not virtues. Uh, you know, there's seven virtues, and if you had to pick one, the most important one by far is courage, because if you don't have courage, you don't get to exercise any of your other virtues. Um, I'm not I'm I'm never been really at all worried about my personal safety in this business at all. I've never had a moment where I thought, well, I don't know, I could really get hurt out there. What if there's some lunatic? That never really occurred to me. I still don't worry about that. But moral courage is, um, is tough. You know, uh, you, you see things that you, that you believe are true and you have a number of different paths to believe it's true. And everybody else in society is determined that you simply can't say that. Well, then either you, put up or shut up. And I've never been afraid to say anything as long as I was convinced it was actual truth and I could back it up with some kind of facts or data or something like that. That ability is a little unusual. That's, I think, is, is some courage. And to my utter amazement, because I suppose like everybody else who, who's uh, in this boat, I think I spent the first half of my life just terrified of being a coward. Of all the things I was most afraid of, I was afraid of being afraid when I, when I needed to not be afraid. And over time, um, I've had enough uh, experiences and emergencies and close calls that lead me to believe that chances are good, because you never know until you know, but chances are good that um, I'd be a good guy in a tight spot, because it, it takes, when things, when things really go south, it's, it's, I'll just tell you what just flew into my mind. When I had something like an engine failure in an airplane, I'm actually quite happy in a weird sort of way because now I get to use all of it you know I get to use everything in the box now now I got I get to use everything in the box and I got and I, I get a chance to really put it together because now I've got to do a lot of things at the same time and I've got to do them well and I've got to do them right and I've got to remember training I've got to remember all the things that I was taught and I also have to be looking at the situation I have to figure out where I'm going all of the observation I did when I was flying all of this stuff it just comes together and it's like okay now if you if you stay calm here everything's going to be fine and you know what to do but there's a you can feel it you know you can feel it it's a rat a little rat that's gnawing on your ankles it's just chewing your skin up on your ankles and it stings it's down there someplace it's down by the rudder pedals and you cannot let that thing get above your ankles you just can't because if it gets above your ankles you're done um, and so I would just simply just I just say I don't have time for this. I don't have time to panic right now, um, which is a great place to be. Uh, if you can pull that off, it's really terrific. Uh, I don't have time to panic right now. I'll panic later. Uh, right now, I've got a problem I have to solve, so how are we going to solve this problem? And just to put a, a, a dot on the airplane malfunction aspect of this, I don't think I've ever seen an accident report where the right action would have been where doing the right thing would have been at the very least survivable and in virtually all cases, even though you might have crumpled the airplane, you'd walk out of it. You'd simply be, you just walk away from it. Um, that's why I study accident reports. You know, one of my flight instructors used an old aviation saw. I said, son, you better learn from the mistakes of others because you're not going to live long enough to make them all yourself. And I thought, that's exactly right. So I look at accident reports and I look at what pilots did and I wonder why they did it. And I thought they did it because they panicked. So many of these accidents are caused by people who've never flown a glider before, and then the engine goes out on an airplane or something, and they don't know what to do. And they just think that just by holding back on the stick, they can will the airplane into the air. But I I had 80 hours, uh, 90 hours of flight time before I ever had an engine. I know exactly what to do with it without an engine. You know, you've got to keep that plane flying. And if you keep it flying, then you will be okay. It's really just the truth. You will, you will be okay. You might end up with a broken foot or something, but if you understand that this airplane has to fly at least at this speed, you can get that airplane level on the ground at minimum flying speed, certainly in, in general aviation airplanes. I cannot imagine a world, including going right into a brick wall, that would not be uh, survivable. The front of the airplane would crush, and it would take a, take a lot, of the, uh, lot of the energy out of it. I'd like to think I'd have the good sense to pull my feet back, 
and and if I don't, then I get a couple of broken legs. People have survived that before. So this is it. You just got to be prepared. And as I've said several times, every single time I fly the airplane, I expect to have a power failure, and I expect to have a power failure at the most worst possible moment. That's what I'm as expecting is going to happen. And when that doesn't happen, I'm pleasantly surprised. But if it does happen, I know what I'm going to do. I know where I'm going. Just don't land on the taxiway, says Dave Big Booty. Poor, 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 poor Harrison Ford. He's a terrific pilot. The audio of him, he landed on a taxiway at, at John Wayne Airport in Orange County. He just thought it was the left runway, and he landed on the taxiway. And then he had to make the call. You know, he gets on the radio, and the, somebody says, uh, I need you to copy down a number. I need you to make a phone call when you get out of the airplane. Okay, jeez. And you write down the number, you call. And I heard the video, I mean, the audio of him talking to the tower, and I've made that call once in my life. And it is so, I'm so there with him. He's, there's nothing you could do to Harrison Ford for having committed this stupid mistake. There's nothing that anyone could do to him that's worse than what he's doing to himself right now. Okay, let's see. 